Welcome everybody. It's really great to have you here today, whatever your time zone may be in London, uh, Chicago, or um, the west coast of the US, or even uh, some parts of Asia. Um, it is very uh, wonderful to have our speakers here today for Vastari's uh, roundtable discussion today. Um, it's quite a topical subject that we're going to be discussing on this webinar. It's about identifying Chinese diaspora within Asian art. Um, this is a topic that's even more poignant today, given the, um, the circumstances politically, and of course, given um, the recent lockdown and um, uh, events around Wuhan, that um, there, there, there has been a lot of discourse that has resonated with people, perhaps not always in the best way. So, um, We've invited two very uh, esteemed speakers to discuss this issue with us here today. We have uh, Inez Swen and uh, Gordon Chung, uh, who will be uh, discussing the subject with me today. Just a little bit more about who I am. My name is Bernadine Brockle-Weeder. I'm the CEO of Vastari, and um, I, we help connect uh, different people around the world uh, for exhibitions. Uh, including in China and in other parts of the world. And uh, we have invited uh, Inez and Gordon here today for this discussion. So let's just uh, step right in to the, to the discourse. Um, I would love to start with uh, looking at each of your uh, careers within the art world and looking at how you got into the art world. Um, so maybe we can start with you, Inez. Could you tell us a little bit more about your career in the art world, what you do now, how you've gotten to that point, et cetera? Well, my career in the art world, um, well, thank you first, Bernadine, for having me on here. And, um, and I guess I should give a little bit of background about myself and that my background is actually all in design. Uh, I, I have my undergraduate in industrial design and then I went and pursued I tried to pursue a master's degree in the history of design. And at the time, um, the only, there were only two programs that even touched on the subject. And um, one was at the VNA in London and the other one was in New York at the Cooper Hewitt. And it was uh, the program of um, the history of decorative arts and design. Um, and it was a great program and I had a lot of fun learning about museums and things like that. But I never could find a job in that, in that avenue of the world. So I started uh, freelancing. And because I have a technical arts background, um, I started to work for artists because they needed help and I needed part-time work. And um, so I started freelancing for different kinds of artists. And, um, and then after a while, I realized I was never gonna find an art, a job in the decorative arts. So um, I transitioned to becoming an arts consultant, like a producer for artists. And then later about more of a business uh, consultant for different arts organizations, artists and uh, galleries and, and uh, things like that. And um, so it was all by accident. Can you tell here. us a little bit more about the ICFAC as well? Um, the ICFAC is an organization that my parents actually started, I want to say like 20 years ago. Because um, they've always been involved in the nonprofits in the arts in Chicago uh, amongst the Chinese community. You know, my dad was the director of our summer camp. They started an organization 40 years ago called the uh, International, uh, the CIFAS, uh, Chinese Fine Arts Society, where they hold a international competition to learn Chinese music every year. And it's still ongoing. And, um, and then they started ICFAC. Originally, it was also music focused, but um, as I started to develop this art career, people came to me and were like, oh, what do you know about Asian art? What do you know about Chinese art? You know, here, I have a bunch of Chinese art. Can you sell it? And I was like, I have no background in this <laughs> None whatsoever. I better start learning, you know, because I felt somewhat ashamed. It's my culture, you know, but I grew up in the West and I don't have much of that. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that subject later on uh, in this discussion. So I guess um, before we go deeper into the, 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 the cultural aspects, Gordon, could you tell us a little bit more about how um, you became an artist? Have you always wanted to be an artist? Um, tell us more. Uh, yeah, I always wanted to be an artist. It was the one certainty in my life uh, that I wanted to pursue. It was only later on that I realized that uh, 
not everyone knows exactly what they wanted to do, but uh, but I did. It was um, it was the clearest path uh, before me. Partly because I I was terrible at uh, school for many many years, and the only good thing that I was at uh, good at was uh, was making art. And so I ended up in uh, uh, Central St Martins. Uh, I graduated from the ninety eight, and then the Royal College in two thousand and one. So I'm a British born artist, and uh, and after the graduating from the Royal College. Uh, and having a look, well, actually, I had to look around uh, the the art galleries when I was in the second year of my uh, BA, thinking that I could choose which gallery I would like to belong to in my naivety. And I realized that having looked through the lists of all the different artists in those galleries, uh, that there weren't any uh, artists with any Chinese names uh, uh, amongst them. So I realized I needed to step up and I started organizing a lot of exhibitions and uh, all the way through, uh, leading up to the largest one at the Royal College during my first year, which ended up involving 172 artists in two disused Victorian school buildings. And uh, since then, um, I've decided not to organise any more shows after, <laughs> after that event. And, uh, and luckily, through uh, um, being invited into other shows uh, through peers and uh, a cumulative effect, uh, uh, ending up in a residency at the Chinese Art Centre, now called the CFCCA in Manchester. Uh, some curators uh, saw my work and put me into one of the most important shows in the UK calendar, uh, the British Art Show. Wow. And you mentioned to me before that um, the British Art Show hadn't had many Asian artists before, or, or Asian heritage artists, um, right? I think it was yeah. only... In over 30, maybe over 30 years of its history, I think there's maybe one artist of Asian descent uh, in, the, in their list. It's, it's a type of uh, exhibition from which, you know, every year, every, uh, it happens every five years. And, and when it does happen, it's like many of those artists that then, some, some of those artists get nominated for the Turner Prize, which of course is another uh, famous uh, art uh, competition i suppose and uh, in the uk calendar again so so it's uh, it's something that's seen seen in high high regard you know and yeah so there's been maybe one you know of uh, uh, east asian of this descent at least anyway so yeah. Um, yeah which is an indication i think of of something you know yeah such a, a significant mi minority within british culture not being represented in in british art is of course uh, impactful and it also can affect people's ambitions right as you mentioned you probably had the opposite feeling you thought wow there aren't enough names there we need to get in there but um others might feel a bit discouraged by not identifying themselves in that group do you think um, I, I, could you rephrase that? So, so, uh, sorry, yeah, maybe I'm being a bit unclear. What I mean is sometimes seeing a, a gap in the market can actually drive you to want to be there. And sometimes it can actually make you feel discouraged because of the fact that you're not represented. And so that makes you feel... Oh, yeah. I mean, I think artists, you know, they don't, they choose to become artists because they're compelled and they have a profound reason for being an artist. You know, that's what drives them forward. But then reality sort of comes, you know, <laughs> crashing towards you. And when you start to see the landscape before you, through which you're going to have to navigate your art career, whatever that means, uh, or however you understood that, um, you can see some of the obstacles uh, before you. And then you sort of step up and, uh, you know, organize exhibitions. You find a route, you know, uh, through it. Um, to be discouraged, um, then I, it can be, I guess, but then also it's really important to recognize what is, you know, what is the type of types of opportunities that are before you and whether you actually need to consciously build, you know, towards it, um, or actually, you know, to make it happen yourself, such as organizing your own shows, etc. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's really impressive to kind of want to make a difference and um uh, well I, i'm gonna shift the question again a little bit more in this introductory phase to talk a little bit about positioning chinese diaspora um as a as a concept if someone asks either of you where you are from what is your answer usually um 
It depends. It really depends on who's asking. Um, I often get this uh, question in the back of a New York taxi cab. And not, I'm not so nice, <laughs> but often actually that question comes from other immigrants because they want to connect and they want to know where are you really from, you know, because we are all part of a Chinese diaspora and my family a long time ago immigrated from China to Taiwan and then to the United States. So that's what they're asking. But ultimately, yeah, if you're the creepy taxi driver, I'm going to tell you to probably F off. <laughs> Martin, is it the same feeling for you? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on the circumstances. You, um, uh, sometimes it is a, a very, you know, uh, it's a question out of curiosity, right? It's kind of, you know, they want to know where where you're from because of the way that you look. You know, they, they may be wanting to empathize or reach out to, you know, a, a similar conversational, uh, something to converse about. Uh, but but the question, in a way, has, has something uh, implicit in it, which is that you don't belong in this, you know, culture in a way, you know, there's, there's that sort of uh, aspect to it. And, um, you know, there's this idea that actually you don't really belong here, you belong elsewhere, you know, and, and I think uh, people of a diaspora sort of uh, uh, origin, if you like, is, is constantly in this kind of in between state of different identities. Um, but this can be positive as well as, you know, as well as what could be, you know, negative, you know, depending on uh, how that question is framed and the agenda behind it. And, uh, but the positivities is that, you know, obviously, uh, diaspora sort of uh, people of diaspora, they, they can, they, they come from two different cultures, they can bridge, you know, between these cultures, you know, this is uh, uh, to increase communication, you know, between understanding uh, as well. Uh, to prevent, you know, a kind of didactic way of understanding, you know, another, another race, uh, if you like. So, you know, it's, it's like Inez says, you know, it depends on the, the context of the question. And I guess looking at it, at this, this just immediately makes me think about um, why we're doing this, uh, why we're having this conversation. It is about kind of sometimes the misunderstandings of diaspora artists, but also how it could potentially be a link towards Asian art. You're, you're describing almost being a bridge and, 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 and helping with one foot in each, uh, on each side. Um, that's a productive way of looking at it. And um, have you felt that at certain moments in your career, maybe that, that has happened, that you've seen yourself go further because you had a foot in both in both uh, cultures, yeah. <laughs> uh, I hope so. Um, that's, uh, I mean, I I can't I can't uh, uh, like have concrete examples, if you like, of uh, uh, having sort of changed someone's mind or something, you know, about uh, uh, China or something, you know. But um, um, just by simply being an artist of diaspora origin, if you like, you know, is uh, you're already sort of, um, I guess, making uh, by uh, inherently, you know, um, uh, a sort of a statement of being in between. Uh, and that is certainly what a lot of my work is, uh, seeks to be about, you know, in a, in a kind of positive way to try and uh, bridge those sorts of um, uh, divides, if you like, particularly in this climate as well. So my last solo exhibition at Edela Santi was about um, uh, a lot about uh, the infrastructural projects of uh, China and trying to demystify the, uh, the 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 sort of didactic sort of grand narratives, if you like, of good versus evil, communism versus uh, democracy, and actually look at the uh, ec economic miracles you know that have happened. So I remember like um, someone asking me about how they felt, uh, uh, how did I feel about uh, China's uh, infrastructural projects? I said, well, you know, 800 million people lifted from poverty, uh, more infrastructure built than the world history combined altogether. And, uh, and then his response was, yeah, it's terrifying. And I was really like surprised, you know, uh, because, um, what what it was was that when he pushed me to ask whether i was terrified i said well you know i guess it depends on whether you feel threatened you know uh, existing in 
a culture through which you have benefited from uh, empire and colonization and uh, the resources that have been extracted as a result and this type of privilege and entitlement of uh, within that culture through which they have dominated the world and seeing a rising power you know on the horizon you know being and and often sort of bracketed as being a superpower or a next superpower uh, and, and, it, and it make and of course you know you're primed your mind is primed you know to see it negatively you know despite the empirical evidence that you know 800 million people lifted out of poverty in the mat in a matter of decades it's a pretty big achievement you know but having grown up in the us and in the uk you will have been raised in the educational system that does teach that way of thinking about things so how did you feel growing up around that narrative I just thought it was really strange. I remember because I actually I'm an immigrant. I immigrated when I was eight years old to the United States from Taiwan, and um, and suddenly there was nothing about a, a Chinese history, Chinese anything in the curriculum. I mean, I was just at the time trying to learn English. But when I got to high school, and I got a command of the language, um, I I petitioned year after year <laughs> to the school board uh, to include world history. Now, I wasn't even just petitioning for Chinese history, I was petitioning for world history because I kept on, I remember I went to the school board in high school and pointed to a map and said, but what about all these different places like Africa and Asia and all these places? When are we gonna learn about them? Isn't that the world? <laughs> you know? So, I mean, it's a, a systemic issue in our education system, you know, and, um, it's going to take a lot, I think, um, of effort to change. Yeah, so my education was obviously in, in, in Britain, uh, in England, and uh, the world, or the definition of the world, uh, wasn't inclusive of uh, China in my education, you know, so much. It was kind of like, it was barely mentioned. It felt like a footnote. And so I, I grew up thinking that China was this sort of insignificant sort of, you know, uh, barely mentioned uh, uh, nation. I didn't realize, you know, that it was like one fifth of the world's population, you know, and that it has over what 5,000 years of uh, history, et cetera. And uh, uh, it was only later on that I learned, learned all of this sort of stuff by myself, you know, with, in my, in my English education, you know, there, there was, um, it was all about, you know, discovering the new world and, uh, you know, uh, it was all about colonial conquest, you know, in, in many ways, you know, slavery was barely mentioned, you know, as anything of particular significance, uh, you know, the dark aspects of uh, colonial, colonialism uh, was barely mentioned. Opium wars, was that ever mentioned in my education? I don't remember. I don't think so, you know, and, uh, and that's something that I've actually been learning about, you know, more recently and uh, being, being really very interested in exploring, you know, particularly uh, with uh, the, on, the current uh, instigated US trade war, you know, with, uh, with China, you know, and uh, these, are, these are incredibly important sort of uh, histories to understand our current histories as well. Yeah, and I, I guess that, that transitions really nicely into um, kind of one of the instigators of this webinar was an event that you hosted called Dim Sum Dialogues that was as a result of recent events and a feeling that there was some racism prevalent in, in, the, in the art world particularly, but also as a result of the wider political situation. Um, Inez, could you tell us a little bit more about how what instigated that roundtable discussion and 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 how it went? Uh, I instigated that uh, discussion because uh, of of COVID nineteen. Uh, I think um, there was just um, like I, I mean the statistics. I think just last week came out um, from CBS News that said over two thousand anti Asian American hate incidences were uh, recorded just between March and June. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty more that didn't go reported. And this is nothing new. It's just that now there's somebody recording it finally. So, yeah, um, so yeah so there was a lot of discussions. I had a lot of uh, young Asian American artists kind of coming to me, talking to me about it. And then I, uh, I started just talking, talking to people and I realized it was like kind of a timely matter. And what's interesting about the, our dim sum dialogues at the time was that it happened the same week that um, George Floyd 
um, was, um, you know, brutally murdered. And, um, and it kind of sparked this like, like movement from a, a lot of, it, it just became even more timely of a discussion is that, you know, it's a systemic problem and that they've been, you know, pitching blacks and Asians against each other in, in the Western world for centuries. You know, because a lot of that came out during the post-COVID-19 era. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it wasn't only Chinese diaspora, uh, people of, of, of Chinese diaspora descent. I, I keep making this a very long term. We're going to have to find a, a, a quicker way of saying it. But it, it was basically anyone that looked different that was targeted through this uh, this Koreans, Japanese, just like the Chinese were targeted during the Japanese internment. You know, similarly, you know, they put Asians all in one group, but, you know, ultimately. And then, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that it's the same thing also that, 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 that China is such a big country and there are so many different Chinese people that if you, if you, if you generalize, it's, it's, it's. Absolutely. Yeah. For example, there's 55 ethnic Chinese groups in China outside of Han Chinese, which makes up the majority. For example, Gordon is Hong Chinese. I am not at all Hong Chinese, but yet we're identified as the same culture. And um, he grew up in Britain. I mostly grew up in the United States. His family immigrated from Hong Kong. Mine came through Taiwan. Totally different. Yeah. And um, I, think, I think these are the things that people need to know. You know, that the, the China, China is, a, being Chinese is a cultural thing. Being from China is a national thing. And being from Taiwan is a national thing. Being from, you know, all of these different places is a national thing. Being Chinese is a cultural thing. And there's millions of people, uh, I believe there's 5 million uh, overseas Chinese just in the US alone. The biggest population is in um, Thailand with um, 10 million Chinese people. But I think oftentimes in the United States, especially in the art world, we don't think about that. We think of Chinese as China. And um, I think we just need to all be aware that there is this giant diaspora and that the artists that are coming out of Taiwan or Hong Kong could also be Chinese. Yes. <laughs> um, Gordon, did you want to say something about that too? Uh, I think Inez uh, said that really, <laughs> really well. So. Great. Yeah, um, and, but, but then I guess, um, the, if, if we look at the discussions that you were having um, post COVID-19 and kind of how the, the, the discourse was oversimplified, do you think there are immediate solutions visible of, of, of what could be done in the art world, but also in the wider world to improve the situation and to raise awareness about things like you were, uh, that you were saying? In it? I think what you're doing is very important. I think having these discussions and just talking about it, just talking to as many people, that's what we try to do with ICFAC, is we just try to talk about it as much as possible. You know, tell people our, our own stories, you know, share other people's stories and actually just make people aware that there is a diaspora. I mean, ever since I started kind of going in this direction with the organization, I talked to people at events about Chinese diaspora and I would say, 60% of the time, more than half, people will say something to the effect of, oh, I didn't know there was a Chinese diaspora. And I'm always like, well, okay, well, let me tell you about it. <laughs> and, um, um, because it's such, it's such a normal thing for me, right? I am a part of different cultures, different minorities that make up a bigger, bigger uh, nationality, I guess, cultural identity. And then on top of that, I got shifted over to the Western world where I had to grow up in between two completely shifting philosophies. So, um, yeah, I'm a big, uh, cause I, I can't identify with one. <laughs> You've also, I've read comments on your, uh, Instagram in which there are people really grateful, you know, for the information that you're also providing, you know, the histories, you know, that they didn't know about, you know, identities that they feel that belongs to them as well, that, you know, they weren't aware of until you know you had sort of written about them and and posted about them uh, and so there's this sort of um you know as as much as there's uh people may uh, not know uh, what diaspora is those that understand that they belong to it are also grateful for 
you know, the, the histories that you have underlined helped sort of uh, show, you know, and, uh, and I think those are really important things, you know, these are stories, you know, that, that are really important to who we are, you know, they, they bind us to uh, and root us in, in histories. And, uh, and, and that's, that's an incredibly important human experience, you know, and uh, in, in some ways, uh, you know, uh, the arts provides a kind of educational platform, you know, through which we can sort of project, you know, the, this type of knowledge, you know, uh, and, and create forums, you know, for people to feel that, yeah, my identity is valid, you know, my history is important, you know, and I really want to know more. I want to understand more about where I come from, where my family origins, etc. You know, and um, and so you know, diaspora. You know, they they can be this very uh, important sort of uh, bridge. You know, between uh, these cultures, these sort of conduits. You know, of information. You know, in order to further understanding between cultures. And how do you feel about the fact that, um, in as you kind of referred to it earlier, that Chinese diaspora art often gets grouped into Asian art? So it was surprising that you were uh, mainly European and American design and decorative arts specialist and not an Asian art specialist. Um, how uh, do you think that's a problem in the art world? Uh, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. And, 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 and to be honest, Chinese diaspora, we're not the biggest population. We're a big chunk of people, but we're not the biggest population. And we shouldn't have, you know, 80% of curators being part of Chinese diaspora. But no, a lot of, I don't think a lot of, just because of the systemic issue of our education, people just aren't aware that it even is a diaspora. So I think that's the biggest problem. And um, yeah. <laughs> And, and I guess there are many museum representatives on this call, and it's, of course, a really interesting subject as well, that as a museum, if you're trying to reach local audiences and speak to people that are in your communities, actually working with the Chinese diaspora artists or um, art professionals, you might also reach Chinese diaspora communities that are in your area. Yes, and Chinese diaspora is so vast. There's probably a Chinese community in your city. And <laughs> probably Chinese artists in your city, you know, before you give Ai Weiwei another show, like look, look locally, you know, it's, it's, it's expensive to ship Ai Weiwei stuff all the way from, <laughs> I don't know, where is he in now, UK? Um, you know, like look locally, you, there's great artists, you know, of Chinese descent all over the world and we're everywhere. And, um, you know, we don't, we, we, sh we shouldn't be a part of the Asian arts department necessarily because I'm American, he's uh, British, you know, we should be. Yeah. And I want to add to that, which is, you know, we are in a very you know, um, strange times, obviously, you know, but also when the most powerful man in the world with the most powerful nation, you know, with all of the military behind, et cetera, is calling a virus, China virus. These are dangerous, this is dangerous rhetoric, you know, and uh, we have seen, you know, previous fascistic leaders use this uh, type of technique and where history has uh, shown us the consequences of such actions, you know, so that much, it's that much more important to be sort of highlighting, you know, the understanding between cultures and uh, the diaspora sort of uh, community are those that have understanding of both, you know, and, and the, the museum world, they are there to uh, create cultural narratives, you know, to fix cultural narratives as well, and to be the conduits of you know, knowledge, you know, and in this circumstance, in this moment, as America and the UK ramps up a Cold War with China, you know, it's, um, it, it is that much more important to create this type of dialogue and to highlight it and go, this is not a history that we want to see, you know, once again, you know, it's, uh, and that's why, you know, the World, World Health Organization, you know, determines that we do not call viruses, you know, uh, a nation or a race, you know, for that reason, you know, as well. So we have to try and help to dispel, you know, some of the dangers that are uh, on the horizon, you know, and, and, and sort of ask ourselves, is this really what we want from our humanity? You know, is this really what we want from our culture? You know, and, and to make a stand, you know, and to, and to point and go, hey, this isn't right, 
you know, yeah. this is not what I want, you know, this is who I am, and this is who we are, you know, and uh, you don't deserve to actually fix that narrative in the mindset of uh, so many people. Yeah, and, and, and you can nuance the narrative as someone who understands Chinese culture, but is not necessarily in China now or, or has necessarily the links to China, but you can be nuanced in how you describe things so that it speaks to both, right? And can, can, can explain things in a more open way. And um, I, I think it dispel, dispel the fear that really exists because of ignorance rather than because of actual fear. Um, do, do you think that there, have you seen examples or, 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 or have you had feelings of, uh, that it is changing or that, that people are trying to, uh, personally, I feel that the press hasn't been taking up the China virus nickname at all. And I think that that is one small way in which people are, are, are trying to resist what is happening. But have you seen other examples of, 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 of positive change or, or things that could be done? Well, I think, I think Fox News is uh, <laughs> obviously uh, a big proponent of this. Uh, yes, okay. I, when I said that, maybe I was talking about... <laughs> but generally, perhaps, <laughs> yeah, in, in liberal media, you know, it's uh, uh, less, uh, less so, you know. But, um, but then, you know, we have to also look at the, the, uh, the political uh, actions that are being enacted right now between the UK and the US, you know, with respect to... Uh, taking themselves out of the extradition uh, uh, situation in Hong Kong, etc., and um, uh, so yeah, it's um, it's it's a yeah, it's a difficult uh, it's a difficult situation, you know, in which um, um, uh, hopefully there'll be there'll be positive uh, positive uh, uh, outcomes as opposed to well, one one positive outcome has immediately been suggested by one of the attendees saying that they're touring an exhibition about the relationship between Asian diasporas in Latin America and the Caribbean. So there we go from 1945 to today. So that already helps, um, helps a lot. Um, we had one question from the chat that I thought was interesting. Um, what are some resources, books, move, music, films, etc., you recommend to further delve into Chinese culture and history? So often I am afraid that the material I take in is whitewashed. But also, I would just love to know what Chinese art has piqued your interest and felt freeing to learn more about. What do you think? Does anyone want to jump on that question? Uh, well, I mean, th there's some um, tons. Uh, I mean, I guess if I'm a more, I would have to, I think, think about that. I could probably put together a list and maybe send it out to you guys to distribute later. Yeah. Yeah. I guess more from that question, what I was also reading into between the lines was a little bit about whitewashed. Chinese culture and history. How, um, it, what are some terms or things that you can notice that then make you realize that, oh, okay, this is maybe not necessarily told in, the, in, in a way that is, 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 is non-biased. Well, Do you have any red flag? I think overall communism is evil, bad, and ugly, right? And it's uh, <laughs> scary and all of that stuff, right? Yeah, so that's pretty much what we were taught. <laughs> <laughs> well true but also Gordon you were saying that a lot of people automatically uh, b before this call when we spoke you said a lot of people automatically think if you're a Chinese diaspora that you are a communist but actually interestingly a lot of people left China because they weren't communists and that's actually probably Chinese diaspora communities have more to say about the uh, not being communist than about being communist um do you want to say something about that? I well, I, in a way, I kind of think is like I was saying about my last show in London in, at Asante. I was trying to trying to almost um, dispel this uh, uh, didactic sort of uh, discourse about communism versus democracy and look at actual political uh, uh, action, if you like, with how China has built all these enormous infrastructure projects, etc. And um, and and to look at like how how many what is what is uh, the the living conditions if you like of the majority of the people you know in those countries rather than sort of like going hey they're all communists and therefore they're bad 
um, and democracy is all about freedom and uh, liberty. These are kind of very simplistic sort of uh, romantic uh, ideas. And I wanted to try and look at the sort of um, some of the more pragmatic sort of mechanisms of how you build a civilization and uh, how you treat its people uh, as well. So there's been a lot of, so a lot of what I read is uh, from um, uh, investigative journalists, uh, so, uh, such as those with Grey Zone and The Intercept. And uh, I tried to cross-reference sort of articles to discern some, uh, as much of the truth as, as I can. And, um, and, that, and that has really helped me to sort of look at, uh, for example, some of the geopolitical um, policies of the US uh, in respect to China. So can you imagine like 400 Chinese bases surrounding uh, America uh, right now? You know, it's an impossible uh, scenario, right? But that is the reality of China, you know. It's, um, and, and once you sort of start to see all of these, you know, chess pieces, if you like, uh, of the situation, and then the longer roots of the histories, histories that I then, you know, find out on uh, documentaries on YouTube or something like that, you know, and uh, um, you, you, you start to sort of like develop a different picture that's beyond the, the, these uh, romantic narratives of communism versus democracy, liberty, you know, versus authoritarianism or something, you know. I mean, look at the way how uh, COVID-19 was uh, discussed, you know, draconian measures by China in lockdown, you know, and, uh, it, and, and then what did the West do? You know, it's, uh, <laughs> yes, they're draconian as well. I don't know, you know, it's kind of, uh, but maybe because it's a democratic kind, it's okay. You know, it's, uh, it's this sort of, um, these kind of uh, contradictions, you know, these kind of cognitive dissonances, you know, in the mind that prevents one from looking at things as objective, more objectively, as opposed to the, the easier route, which is this sort of romantic sort of uh, notion of, uh, yeah, democratic ideals versus communist uh, ideals. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, I think you just search for the best sources of information that you can, while also reading, you know, some of the, what I would uh, term as uh, propaganda as well. Yeah, which exists on both sides, right? So absolutely, you know, absolutely. Read yeah. between the lines on both uh, in both cultures. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to like say that uh, just because right now I sound like this, that I'm maybe defending China or something. You know that no, no, no. I like I enjoy democracy and I like the ability to be able to vote for my leader. You know, but mm -hmm. I want to look at things. You know, kind of in in a geopolitical uh, light, and uh, to understand that there are many mechanisms here beyond you know, the, the democracy versus uh, communism, uh, good versus evil narrative, uh, that actually there's a, there's a, there's a long-standing geopolitical game uh, uh, being enacted by civilizations uh, right now with a long-standing history, such as the, I, I said before, such as the Opium War uh, that led to the uh, Hong Kong being uh, ceded to the UK. And, um, and they never gave democracy to Hong Kong people other than two years prior to handover. And yeah. now they're going, Hong Kong deserves democracy, you know, as if uh, they're coming in to as savior or something, you know. Um, and now they're enacting these policies that are gonna be damaging to uh, Hong Kong people, uh, you know, but, um, but it, once again, you know, the narratives of good versus evil is so strong that uh, it blinds one to the actual uh, geopolitics that are being played uh, as well. Yeah, and the nuances of, 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 of the motives behind each side and what's what's happening. Um, I think there's a really interesting question that's just been kind of collaboratively posed on our on our chat. Um, so there, uh, what the ac uh, question is, is in addition to explaining the diasporic experience to non Chinese people, how do you explain the Chinese diasporic experience to people in China? who may not realize that we are also part of the Chinese narrative. Um, what, how, how do you feel about your narrative as it is seen in China? Um, well, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I think um, diaspora has a, a really big meaning, right? Um, I think we, we talk about diaspora here as being kind of like Gordon says, in between the East and the West. And there's also diaspora within Asia, of course, you know, of the Chinese from Thailand, Vietnam, 
Philippines, mm -hmm. Japan, you know, Korea. And, uh, and, um, and I think that, and that diaspora itself is, is its own thing. And as well as the diaspora within China and that it's made up of 55 ethnic minorities. So I, I want to say thank you to all the people actually from Asia, actually staying up to um, watch this. And maybe we could do this discussion there at their time zone, you know, at a more timely time so we can give them exposure and explain. My Chinese isn't so great, but it's all right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I guess that's that's a very good point. We we definitely chose a Western time zone for this discussion right now, but we will be recording it and publishing it on, well, YouTube, which may not be accessible on some in some locations. But um, but yes, hopefully we will get more of this discussion going. Um, Gordon, do you think that your work speaks to a Chinese audience? Well, I had a solo exhibition in Shanghai um, and uh, a journalist uh, insisted that uh, there was no uh, Chinese aspect uh, to my work, you know, that it's very Western. Um, huh. Funnily enough, in the West, you know, quite often <laughs> it's one of the first things that they sort of maybe talk about in my work. I say, oh, yes, he's of Chinese descent and you can see this, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and so on. So, uh, you can't help uh, these things other than to keep going, keep showing, you know, and try to sort of um, uh, change the narrative, if you like, the perception uh, that uh, just by being of uh, Chinese descent, I guess, you know, in some ways makes uh, your work inherently, in some ways, you know, uh, Chinese uh, as well, as well as being Western. Uh, like in SS, you know, we, we belong to a kind of in-between uh, space and um, and and that can be very powerful. I think uh, it's not to, it's not that we necessarily belong to uh, either or, but actually both at the same time. And uh, that's a that's a really positive, uh, I think, uh, stance uh, uh, from which, like I said, uh, it, it can be the conduit of knowledge and understanding. And I guess that there's a difficulty in, in today's world that we're all doing everything on databases. So there has to be a field of where, what nationality you are and, and, and where you're from and that type of thing and that people then define who you are. Do you feel that, that that ambiguity is in all of your work or sometimes you do work that might be more Western or work that is more Chinese? And then would you, how, how do you look at your works? Are there some that you know how someone describes that you can definitely see that there is a Chinese influence in your work or something? Is it that you purposely are trying to reference that visual, um, th those visual like uh, triggers, or is it actually something that is subconscious and that you wouldn't be able to divide? I, I do specifically look at certain bodies of work. So for example, the, I was responding uh, after 2008, the first financial crisis, uh, trying to look at the, the first economic bubble and that led me to the Dutch golden age. And then from there, that was the birth of modern capitalism and uh, the first economic bubble and also globalization as well, the East India Trade Company. And then that led me towards, and so that led me towards looking at uh, still life imagery from there, uh, from the Rijksmuseum. And I used an algorithm to blur it in order to question fixed narratives of histories, histories written by victors. So in a way I was sort of suggesting that in some ways, this is culture being a propaganda tool, you know, in that it's defining a certain type of history that whitewashes some of the darker aspects of colonization, uh, militarized trade routes, uh, et cetera. And then that led me to looking at uh, uh, eventually towards uh, the opium wars. And, uh, what, and then from there, we, I, I hope most of us understand what happened to China as a result of that. And you use the word glitch, which um, I guess makes you think that it was a mistake that needs to be fixed or, or, or a temporary failure of the, of the equipment yeah. somehow. So uh, uh, there's, there's a subculture of artists who really appreciate the aesthetics of the glitch. The glitch is a, obviously, yeah, considered to be a mistake in technology, but what happens with a glitch is that you simultaneously see that you're looking at the screen as well as understanding that there's been a, a rupture in the reality or illusion of what you're looking at. 
And in that moment, in that perceptive moment, that space that opens up before you, there's a question. You can question the narratives that are uh, uh, enfolded into that space. And so the types of images that I choose are, are specific to ask a question about those histories that are being determined by who exactly and from what agenda. So kind of that moment where you suddenly step back and see it differently. And you, you yeah, you, 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 see, you see that there's a broken illusion of an image, uh, but also the mechanical reproduction of the image as well. So you've got these different sort of multiple layers, you know, in, in, in the work as a result of the rupturing by the glitch. The glitch is actually uh, done by an algorithm that reorganizes the pixels, but it doesn't destroy copy over, uh, over them. It reorders them. So for me, it's, a, it's this metaphor of a new order. You know, it's this kind of, uh, this, this notion that uh, a history uh, isn't fixed, it's actually in flux. And that the types of understandings that you can bring to it um, can help to uh, make that history more liquid, you know, in that now you can understand it and comprehend it past the agendas of those that have written it from the position of a victor. Yes. <laughs> I just <laughs> want to take a moment to absorb that because that was completely uh, on point on, 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 on what is, what, what all of these recent discussions, including the Black Lives Matter movement and all of the things that have been happening recently are about addressing these issues and being able to identify those, those, fail, those, those failures, those mistakes and re reorder them. Um, uh, you, uh, also in, 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 a, in a previous discussion, you mentioned about how Chinese history has been rebranded or invisibilized. You use that as a verb um, uh, in the past. What do you think, um, it, it relates to this glitch concept, but um, what aspects of Chinese history specifically are you thinking about when you say that? Well, actually, I, I was thinking uh, a lot uh, more about China virus, you know, the phrase of China virus and, uh, and how it's a, a propaganda, you know, rebranding is, I guess I was using that as a polite way of describing propaganda. And then invisibilizing is the lack of representation, you know, the lack of representation of the diaspora and of the, of, of the histories that they have contributed to and, and the value that they've added to culture. You know, and also the opportunity of creating those bridges of understanding as well, uh, uh, as opposed to, I understand that museums have to sort of go for the big ticket sort of shows, etc. the spectacles and, uh, you know, to get the footfall into, you know, they, they, there are many uh, pressures that I, I wouldn't understand what a museum would have to, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, fulfill. And, um, but uh, I, I feel that their role is also as an important, you know, space and forum for education. And what better sort of like, you know, group uh, of, uh, of uh, community uh, can, can help uh, bridge, uh, like I said, I keep saying these bridges of understanding, you know, these conduits of knowledge, et cetera, you know, um, are, are those that are in between, you know, they, they are, you know, able to understand, you know, both sides and belong to both uh, at the same time. They, they already, you know, uh, literally, you know, bridge those cultures. Yeah, and making it visible is one big step and we're in the visual arts, right? So it, it, it's a way of visualizing what- Yeah, what and it should be complex, you know, it's uh, because we are complex, you know, as well. It, it shouldn't be afraid of uh, such uh, uh, the diversity of humanity. You know, it's uh, this is who we are. You know, and what better what better place to to express that than through these uh, fantastic institutions, you know, that uh, have this enormous platform and power to be able to change the narratives, you know, of our cultures and of our national identities, you know, of uh, of uh, the population's mindset. You know, the it's a huge amount of uh, uh, influence that they they wield. You know, and uh, this is a perfect timing in order to do that, you know, in order because of the, the dangers of what, you know, uh, the president uh, are, is, um, is advocating, you know, for with the type of rhetoric that he's trying to create this kind of uh, black and white sort of issue 
you know, with no gray, you know, uh, spectrum between uh, in order to, you know, it's an either or, you know, you're either against us or with us uh, mentality. And uh, this is extremely divisive and uh, damaging, you know, especially when blame is portioned onto a minority, you know, of a nation uh, and the result being a spike in hate crimes. I... I think that's one of the strongest uh, pitches for uh, ex exhibiting more uh, works by Asian diaspora artists I've ever heard um, <laughs> to raise awareness and to really be able to pinpoint the nuances of, 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 of all the different things without having to be so black and white about it. Art has a wonderful way of being able to be a bit ambiguous and a bit un a bit more open and as you were saying we're imperfect so let's be let's use art as a tool to be able to exalt those imperfections yeah i do want to mention also in the uk at the moment there is actually a show of chinese diaspora artists at the cfcca in manchester uh, right now um so there are um i mean the remit is part uh, it involves uh, uh, having to do that um, as part of their core beliefs. Um, so uh, it, it, there, it, there, are, there are moments. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course. And I don't think it's something that has been completely ignored. Um, but I think a lot of um, perception also on who the patrons are, a, a lot of the patrons are Chinese. So does uh, then they might focus on Chinese art rather than Chinese diaspora art to attract those those larger patrons and donors from China. Um, do, do you think that there's, uh, there is also a community of sponsors and donors coming together for, China, uh, for, for Asian diaspora in general, but specifically Chinese diaspora art? I, no, I, I don't <laughs> think so. <laughs> uh, I, I think there are people who collect specifically uh, Chinese American or, uh, you know, maybe uh, Chinese, um, they may not be always called Chinese diaspora because art from Taiwan is often not, is totally different on opposite side of the spectrum from art from China. And, uh, and that's technically diaspora, right? Um, and um, yeah, I, I don't think that, that the term Chinese diaspora, I don't think is used often enough to describe our group. We're often called overseas Chinese, we're often called um, uh, you know, Asian Americans, Asian -American. Asian Americans, uh, British born Chinese, you know, we're, we have all these different names, but it's about the general, just diaspora in that Chinese is a cultural belongingness. It's not a, a, a political group or we're not all the same, you know, bottom line. <laughs> I think that um, that's a really nice note to, 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 to end our conversation on and to, to just highlight the fact we're not all the same. We, uh, we have to acknowledge these different discussions and make sure that, uh, that, 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 that there is the nuance in the vocabulary we use and an acknowledgement of these communities and an awareness of how the, languages, uh, the language that's being used has an effect on the wider um, ecosystem. Um, I really enjoyed speaking to both of you today. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time. I think we have a to-do list. We're going to be putting together some resources for everyone who uh, attended the webinar in case you want to read more. And uh, we can also share uh, a, a link to Gordon's work uh, as well. And I think it would be fantastic uh, that if this discussion triggers more people to think about this in a different context and to really question their own biases. Um, were there any last thoughts you had you'd like to share before closing the conversation? Um, I think this resource page, we'll probably put it on our website as well. So people can go to icfac.org to take a look. And I believe uh, we recently uh, uploaded a few more exhibitions uh, to Vistari for Gordon Chung. So um, please take a look. And um, thank you so much, Bernadine, for hosting this and Vistari as well. Uh, great. We really enjoyed it and um, look forward to hearing how the effects of this conversation. And hopefully lots of people will look at your exhibitions on Vistari as well. Very good. Have a great uh, evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you are. And um, thank you again, Inez and Gordon.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And to everybody that came as well. Yes, the amazing number of participants. Thank you.